common knowledge about prayer in Judaism usually revolves around the technical side of prayer. The idea that we know that we need a minion in order to do certain prayers, we know that the quorum for prayer is a quorum of 10, and that constitutes a minion. But where does that come from, and what does it mean? Why did we settle there? Why has that never changed in terms of the number? What is the source for all of that? And most of the foundational information about a minion is actually coming from this week's Parsha in Shlach Lecha. And interestingly, it's not coming from a high point um, in the moment. Rather, it's coming from the group of 10 men who returned as spies from, from the land and decided to collude together and lie about the land of Israel to the people of Israel because they gave in to their fears and their insecurities and they allowed that to shape their perspectives. That's where we're getting the model for a minion, a prayer quorum of 10. It's shaped on the 10 spies. So Moses originally sends 12 spies in, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and only Joshua and Caleb return praising the land. They come bringing examples of huge fruit, which is a perfect example because it means the land can feed them. It will produce amazing things that they can sustain themselves on. And they give a glowing report. The other 10 do not. The other 10 report a land where they say, quote, it eats its inhabitants, that there are giants and fortresses, and the land itself will only represent death, death and destruction to all of the Israelites. And the Israelites believe the 10. They don't believe the two. And so the nation refuses to enter the land. And everything that had been promised to the ancestors, all of the exodus from Egypt, Sinai, and the importance of the revelation of Sinai, the journey to the border, and now Israel is believing 10 men who are maligning, underlying the trust, and really pulling the foundation out of everything, and Israel refuses to enter. At that moment, once it all plays out, they realize, the nation realizes the betrayal of the moment, that they've betrayed God and betrayed their destiny, and so they change their minds. And they say, okay, let's do it, and they mount an attack into the land, and they are horribly defeated. The losses are enormous, because God is not with them at that moment. It's one thing for them to say, yes, I realize we betrayed God, but then they did not turn back and make it right. They simply said, let's do it the other way. And there was a rift that had not been repaired, and Israel paid the price for that. Now what happens is, Israel will now remain in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the moment that that happens. The entire generation that left Egypt will now die out in the wilderness. They've proven that they can't change their views. This moment shows that they cannot overcome their fears and they can't envision a new life in that land. There's too much insecurity that's come with them. There's too much of a slave mentality and fear that's come with them. So they will live their lives out in the wilderness. It is their children who will be able to enter the land and fulfill a destiny all because they listened to 10 misguided and panicked men. And this becomes the model for Arminian, is those 10 men. How do we get from 10 spies to the model of a minion? And it has to do very much with the words that are being used in the Torah to describe the moment. First of all, the idea of a prayer quorum comes from the book of Leviticus, one verse that says that when God is speaking of holiness and of that relationship, God says, I will be sanctified amidst the children of Israel, meaning right in there among the people, with the proximity in the people. That is when holiness occurs. That is when God infuses. And somehow, there's a way to bring the divine holiness to infuse the people that way, to create that kind of proximity. And that's what we're looking for with this quorum, is to bring divine presence as close as we can. And that verse tells us that we can. So from there we ask, how do we create that moment? And now we turn to the sources from this week's Parsha, because this week's Parsha is going to be using the same words to talk about the assembly of Israel. And the word for assembly is going to be the one we want to look at to say, what does that mean technically? 
how do we get an assembly? So the first one is, when we talk about the assembly of these 10 men, we're noticing that word. And then later on, when it says that we should separate ourselves from the midst of the assembly, and now we've combined all the words together. And in all those words, we now import the meaning. The midst of the people is where holiness can occur. Assembly of the people needs to be defined so that we can create the midst within it. So there needs to be an assembly to bring God's presence into the midst of the people, and the word assembly keeps referring to those ten men. God's presence in the assembly will move into the core of it, and holiness will dwell in the midst of it. The word minion itself means to count, and it sounds like a beautiful privilege that we would be bringing people together to count together to reach that tipping point where we now can infuse holiness and divine presence right into our very midst. It sounds like a beautiful privilege. But there's a technical side to it as well. And I remember being very little and watching my grandparents. They lived in Tzfat in Israel, and they lived in the old city of Tzfat, which still gathers a minion for prayer by someone, the Gabbai, walking up and down the alleyways, calling out what number you need for the minion. And I remember sitting there and watching as my grandparents were having breakfast and I could hear outside the gabbai's yelling, fourth for the minion, fourth for the minion. And my grandmother said to my grandfather, go. They're, they're at number four, they need the fourth one. And my grandfather sipping his coffee and as she's continuing to say to him, you need to go, I hear him say, I'll go when he gets to eight. When I hear him calling eight for the minion, I'll go. So in other words, if you're fourth in that minion, you're going to sit and you're going to wait while everybody else is gathering. And there's a practical side to that as well. So on the one hand, we feel the privilege and the holiness of it. And the practical side of it is we're actually waiting for our fellow person to show up so that we can reach that group together. This has gone on in Judaism forever. This has gone on from the ancient world right into the modern world of understanding that. And so we're going to look carefully at the model for a minion. It's 10 men. So a minion was counted as 10 men, very specifically. And the question, of course, is with our model in the Torah, how particular are we going to be when we import that model? So certainly minion means counting, so we want the number. The number is 10. But are we going to stop there? And the answer is we never stopped there. We said it was 10 men. So now, in fact, we're going to be counting a minion as 10 men. And for millennia within Jewish history, that was absolutely the standard and it was never questioned. But if we then say, okay, so why am I stopping there? If I'm going to take in that detail, let me look at the other details as well. These were the spies. So these were 10 men who spoke badly about the land of Israel and cost the people 40 years in the wilderness. They're not model citizens. So would I sit there and say, therefore, anyone that I would count into a minion can't be this this outstandingly righteous person, because I want to be able to parallel it with who the spies were. And we don't do that. Of course we don't do that. But we actually take away the privilege of the moment. So we say, although it sounds like what a privileged thing to be part of a quorum that infuses God and holiness, but the other side is saying, but we're modeling it on people who were quite human. We're modeling on people who represent us. So there is no privilege here. It is to count the people that walk in and want to be participants. And that is how we would count it. We're looking for ordinary people. And when we go back to the model and we say, OK, well, 10 men. We've imported 10 men. And I can pretty much guarantee that in that time and in the wilderness, those men had beards. So are we now going to say we need 10 men who have beards? I can also pretty much guarantee that they had long hair. They were wearing robes. I mean, at what point are we going to say, no, we're cutting the model here? And clearly, we can see the problem. Because are we arbitrarily deciding? what it is about that model that we're going to bring into our minion. The model of 10 men for a minion had served to exclude women from the count. But it also served to exclude women entirely. Because if I only need the quorum, 
then why do I need anything beyond the 10 men? Do I need the 11th man? Do I need the 12th man? Because now it becomes a question of if I don't need women for the minion, do I need women in prayer at all? And it becomes an exclusionary model rather than the quorum that triggers inclusion. Clea Carr, interestingly, the chief rabbi of Prague in the early 1600s, comments on the spies, and he says something astounding. He says, the men hated the land, for they said, quote, let us turn around and return to Egypt, in the book of Numbers, whereas the women loved the land, for they said, quote, give us a holding in it. And that's the daughters of Slavchad who went to Moses and said, we want land. How are we not getting land? Therefore, continues Kliakar, the Holy One said, in my opinion, for I know the future, it would have been better to send the women who love the land and would not speak ill of it. In the Torah, God gave Moses the choice of who to send, Shlachlecha. But Moses had a blind spot and looked only for men. It's an interesting blind spot for him to have because it was his mother, his sister, and the daughter of Pharaoh who actually saved and secured him. But it's a blind spot, and he doesn't see it. And sometimes even the best leaders have blind spots when it comes to diversity. So the question of in your midst, and there's a power to having things infuse within our midst. When I was in Israel, I was saying Kaddish, for my father during the first year. And one time I was attending just a minion in the streets of Tel Aviv and I got there a few minutes late and I missed Kaddish and I started crying. I was very upset it was the first time I had missed Kaddish. And the men in the minion, because I was the only woman who stepped in there, didn't understand why I was crying. And I was trying to explain to them through my tears, I've missed Kaddish, you're finished now, you're gonna leave. I don't have a minion, I won't be able to say Kaddish. And one of them turned to the other and said, oh, she needs to say Kaddish. But meanwhile, I watched them. They're looking at their watches because they're late for work. So they quickly circled me, pulled out the sidur, and then we all said Kaddish. And I felt in their midst. And it was so powerful. And it was a moment that was unplanned. And the minion created the holiness. And I stood in their midst. And the power of it is something I often can't find words to convey. The Jewish minion is an evolving thing. For so long, it was only 10 men, and then some communities accepted a count of 10 women, while many traditional communities adopted the practice of counting a minion as a quorum of 10 men and 10 women before they feel that they can start prayer. And there are many minyanim who say it is a quorum of 10 people, gender notwithstanding. So we're looking at the number, and we're going for the word minion, and minion means count. Ultimately, the quorum is empowered by the people. The spies were chosen from among us, not designated by God. The power of the minion is to invite God into our midst, into our midst that we've created. We have not been commanded by God. It is the moment we turn to each other and recognize that together we define ourselves and then unite to create firm Jewish moments that speak from our souls out into the world and upwards to the eternities. <laughs>